Hi, everybody, and welcome. We have a fabulous show for you today. Two more of our exceptional women awardees, incredible female leaders who are truly changing the world that we live in. We have with us Kathy Ross. She is the general manager and executive leader of Abbott's premier US workplace drug testing and occupational health company. It is truly an amazing role that she plays and we're so happy to have her with us today. We have also with her Nicole Muscondis, who is the co-CEO of Nicholas and Company, a third generation company in the Midwest that is in the food distribution area. Both of these women leaders are going to give us incredible insights on supply chain and labor shortages and the solutions that they have come up with. I'm Lorraine Siegel, and I'm the founder, chair, and CEO of the Exceptional Women Awardees Foundation. We enable high-level women to rise to meet their dreams, just like Nicole and Kathy. Why did I start this foundation? Well, I never had a mentor. When I was early in my career as a lawyer and then as CEO of a variety of different companies, and even as a board director, I never had a coach. And I always wanted to be sure that women who walk the road less traveled, as I have, would have a supportive group of women leaders to enable them to rise to meet their dreams for the rest of their lives. And that is exactly what we do at the Exceptional Women Awardees Foundation. So let's get right to it. I want to bring again and introduce Kathy Ross and Nicole Muscondis. Welcome, ladies. I'm so happy to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go right to it. Kathy, you have been at the eye of the storm. What an amazing accomplishment Abbott has had in developing the Binax tests. I have six of them in my closet, <laughs> and I know everybody's always been trying to get them, not easy to obtain. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Well, I joined Abbott in February of 2020 and to run our drug and occupational health testing business. And five weeks in is when COVID really hit and sent us all home. Um, then the subsequent months after uh, COVID really taking hold, Abbott was in the works of spinning up um, a number of COVID tests. So to date, we have over 12 COVID tests available that we've developed since the beginning of the pandemic. One of those being the first rapid um, test that was released to the market. So Abbott is a leader in rapid di diagnostics. Um, and has many tests for different types of diseases that can be detect those diseases very quickly through a rapid test. And so um, there was a real a magnific magnificent effort across all of Abbott with our suppliers and supply chain and spinning up factories in order to bring out the Binax test to the market. So um, spring of 2020 is when Abbott embarked upon this, when you hear our CEO speak. And then in August of 2020 is when we released that first rapid diagnostic test from Abbott called Binax Now. So it was really a fascinating um, process to see a number of hundreds of hundreds of people come across the business to come together to launch a product like that and to really make a difference in the fight against COVID. Amazing. You know, Kathy, uh, this is something to tell your grandchildren because it's not often in one's work life that you are literally on the cusp of something that is so revolutionary enabling health of the world. So congratulations on that and to Abbott. And interestingly enough, Nicole, you have been at the eye of the storm, but in a different way, and that is enabling us to get access to the food supply. Tell us a little bit about your company and how you managed in the past year. Yeah, so Nicholas and Company is a third generation food service um, distributor. We are located in the Intermountain West and serve about seven states in the Intermountain West. And as you can imagine, the beginning of the pandemic, we had you know all of our restaurants shutting down. We had, um, once they came back online, then we had social distancing requirements. And this was not just for our, our customers, but also for our suppliers. And what we're seeing now, uh, you're hearing about on the news, you're seeing it, reading it, supply chain disruption issues, labor issues are continuing as we continue to navigate through COVID-19, we're still not through it. We think the supply chain disruption issues are going to last for months, if not years. Uh, and um, we're just working through as much as we can by partnering with all of our suppliers to make sure that we know what products they have, 
when we can get them trying to transparent uh, to communicate with transparency with our customers to make sure that they have product in stock. It's an interesting dilemma because in many respects, certainly in the United States, we're quite spoiled because when we want something, we normally can find it. But now, Nicole, that's not necessarily the case. Are you being able to tell customers, look, I can give you this, but I can't give you that. And are they coming to terms with it and changing their menus? How is that working? Yes, yeah, so before the pandemic, for distributors, SKU rationalization was definitely something that almost all distributors were, were dealing with, trying to limit the number of SKUs they have in their warehouse to be more efficient, to get more leverage in terms of pricing so that you're buying more from one key supplier versus 50 different suppliers that carry similar products. And I think this, this pandemic has forced us to relook at that and to recognize that we have to be able to just have some product available. So you know, going through in advance with customers and determining what kind of substitute items are acceptable to them and to their brand has been something that we've been working with all of our customers on. We might not have mayonnaise brand A, but we have brand B and we have brand C, and it's better than having no mayonnaise at all. So that's something that we're, it's, it's continual work in progress, and we're constantly just communicating with suppliers to make sure we know what they have and we know what's coming into our warehouse, and then able to tell our customers, this is what we have. And so definitely, fact, I'm sorry, I was going to say definitely they are um, adjusting their menus accordingly. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we used to talk about customer relationship management. You're probably more involved with your customers and their needs now than ever before. Would that be an accurate statement? There, there's no question. We have to be face to face in front of our customers, understanding what their menu needs are and the, the customers themselves are changing their menus. You'll notice as a consumer, if you go to your favorite restaurant, they might not have as many items on, on their menu as they used to prior to the pandemic. Um, and it's because they wanna make sure that they, they don't have to tell customers as they're coming in that we're out of you know all of these items today. So they're paring down their menus, they're getting more creative with um, reusing product and what they do have and definitely does require much more communication than ever before. Yeah, I've definitely noticed that. And so, Kathy, uh, Abbott has been tremendously responsive when other things beyond COVID has happened. So I remember you telling me a little bit about a hurricane that occurred in one of your areas of service. So tell us a little bit about that and how you dealt with that. Right. So Hurricane Ida, unfortunately, um, hit in uh, New Orleans, where we have one of our labs. And so you know, we had a lot of employees who weren't able to get to the lab or couldn't return to the lab even after service for power was restored, et cetera, because of the impact that they were dealing with um, in their own lives, in their personal lives. So we needed to come up with a way to make sure that we could serve our customers and get our, our specimens um, processed through our lab. So we had an all hands effort um, to go down to New Orleans and to help um, during that time frame when we needed to make sure we were serving our customers and, and getting those specimens um, processed. So I went down along with my uh, several of my team and uh, people from across the business to make sure that we were still operational. Um, and it was really an eye-opening and great learning experience because sometimes you don't always get to meet everybody in your business or you don't always get to spend time in parts of the business that you normally wouldn't have. Um, but I was able to be in that lab with my team and with a lot of our other volunteers who went to work the evening shifts and, and do the do the work. And it was um, it was different work. It's it's handling urine specimens for drug testing. So, but what I learned was, um, you know, every every person's job in a business is so vitally important. And you know, getting to work alongside the employees in that lab and seeing the spirit of the service that they had when the times were really tough was really rewarding as well as um, showing <clears throat> excuse, excuse me showing the resilience of, um, of our company and of our employees as well as the, the spirit of service we have to making sure our customers are served. So um, every challenge can come with great um, outcomes and learning and, um, and new ways of looking at the world and your business. Absolutely amazing. You know, uh, it has been said in the past that management by walking around is really the only one way to manage. And I think that leadership by walking around is exactly like that as well. And so you certainly have an appreciation of, of every part of the company and the people who contribute to that. It's amazing. So, Kathy, I know that you don't live in the same place as you work. So 
and during COVID, I don't think it mattered that much. But now you're back to traveling back and forth and commuting. How is that? And and what are your thoughts about that? Have you had to adapt the way you live your life? Yes, uh, most definitely needed to adapt. Um, before COVID, we had planned to fully relocate to Kansas City, where I work, from Atlanta. And um, with COVID, you know, a lot of people have changed how they look at life and values. And so we decided that we weren't fully relocating, although I do have a, a place to live in Kansas City, but I do go back and forth because my husband and our daughter are at home and our son is in college in, in Georgia as well. So um, I go between Atlanta and Kansas City. And, and definitely when you're working and living in you know, two different places, you really have to make sure that you look at your time and what you're prioritizing. So when I'm in Kansas City, I'm heads down on work and I work a lot when I'm in Kansas City because I don't have my family around. I do have some friends though that I've made. Um, but in Atlanta, it's all about family, prioritizing my friends, um, making sure I'm seeing the people who are most valuable in my life um, and making sure I'm being very intentional with my time. So I optimize time everywhere I am with traveling between two cities. And I guess one of the most important aspects of that is having a really good and supportive partner, which obviously your your husband is, and we know he is. Um, and that's, you know, it's not easy. You have to re-enter your marriage every time you go home. Do you have that feeling as well sometimes? Yeah, sometimes I do. Um, you know, I've traveled a lot of my life, so I'm used to that back and forth, but it's a little different when it's five full days a week and you're traveling back on Sunday and out on late Friday night. So there is uh, there is that transition, and I, I do talk about transitions a lot. Um, we've had to transition a lot through COVID, so I think people are learning that they, they have this adaptability um, you know, muscle that they've had to really exercise a lot more in the midst of a pandemic, and then I get to do that a little bit differently every time I go back and forth. And so I try to make those um, transitions, happy ones and ones that are more celebratory as much as I can, even though I get really tired at the end of the week. Um, but it's how we look at that and how we want to transition back um, it, that makes all the difference. It's a wonderful thing. And, you know, what you've learned and what you share with the other women in EWA is so important because I would say 99% of our leaders are exactly in a similar position in one way or the other. And so we do share those experiences and how to cope with them. So, Nicole, you had an amazing early childhood and talk about transitions and learning to cope and being adaptable. Would you tell us a little bit about how you started your career at the age of eight? Sure. I, I definitely walked the road less traveled. I was a competitive gymnast early on in my life. And back in the day, when you were on the national team, there were really only about four different gymnastics clubs across the country that had the right equipment, the right coaching staff, the right sort of team competitiveness uh, in order for you to continue your career and succeed. And so I started when I was about eight and a half years old. My parents lived in Milwaukee and there were the closest gym that had all of that was in Chicago. So it was an hour and a half commute each, each way and going three days a week was fine. Four days a week was a little tougher because I had a little brother and my parents were both working. By the time I got to six days a week, it was too much. And I lived uh, with one of my coaches in Chicago during the week and I would come home for a day every single week. And then when I got onto the national team, it was apparent that I needed to move on to another club. So I went to Corolli's Gymnastics right away um, in Houston, Texas. And that is a name that is well known to anybody who has watched just gymnastics in the past 20 years, because that is probably one of the most renowned coaches and probably one of the toughest too. So Nicole, what did you learn from that experience? Well, I think, you know, being that young and being away from home, you don't really know anything different. So it's hard to kind of say that there's a comparison that I that I would look at. I, I would say that everything I am today is certainly definitely somehow related to my early career in gymnastics, because I obviously learned how to be very independent at a very young age. I learned how to work hard. I learned about, you know, work ethic and discipline. And certainly all of those skills have served me well now as in, in my professional career. So it's something which you've also learned to adapt because for a young child at eight and a half to be living away from home uh, and then it's more than that though, because there's a lot of failure in gymnastics, probably more failure than success. Can you address 
how that has helped you deal with failure and success in your corporate life? Sure. And I think the word that comes to mind probably more than adaptability is grit, grit and resilience. And so certainly something like we've all gone through right now with, with this pandemic you know, you have a lot of failures in your early career. You learn to get back up and do it again and fall down again and get back up. And so you you learn that sort of discipline of uh, continuous grit and continuous resilience has been very, very helpful. Yes, it's and tough. It made you tough, although you certainly don't act tough, but you are within yourself. You have great resistance and the ability to change. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so Kathy, I know that you didn't start your uh, career at Abbott. You mentioned that you joined Abbott in 2020. Tell us a little bit about your career. I know you were an SVP at ADP for many years. How did you get to ADP? How did that happen? Well, I um, graduated from a hotel school at Cornell and then went to work for Aramark Corporation for two years and decided after two years that I wanted to try something new. And I was talking to a friend and asking her, what was she doing? And she said, well, I, I work in sales for this company called ADP, which I had no idea who they were. But um, I said, well, I'm interested in sales and I'm interested in HR. And she said, well, that's, that's the perfect mix for a company like mine because we are in payroll and HR. And so you should come and interview. So that's, um, that's how I got into ADP. She introduced me, I got an interview. They were right on the ball. They hired me and I started selling payroll door to door to small businesses in a territory in New Jersey um, and, and did that for a couple of years and then worked my way up into sales. And I never thought I would be at the company for more than about five years because at that time, people in sales um, didn't do anything else. They either sold or they left. Um, but I was a little bit of a unicorn. And over the course of my 25 years, I had the opportunity to go from sales to product marketing, to product management, to business development, to running um, three startup organic businesses within ADP, um, to heading up service, to then leading into a general manager position. And then I went up the general management track from there. So. I had a fantastic career. I did a lot of different things, traveled the world, um, experiences that I, I am forever grateful for ADP for, but after 25 years decided I'm ready for something different. Um, and so at the time when I was looking, Abbott called and I thought, well, I knew Abbott's name. I knew they were a great company. I knew they stood for quality and had an incredible brand. Um, and it was a business that just seemed very exciting and one that was that had so much growth potential. So I, I love to grow businesses and came to Abbott and here I am today. Well, you could never have imagined what that next year would bring, but what, what, what about being at the right place in the right time? That is amazing. Um, Kathy, would you say to our audience, because I'm sure there are a lot of people who are wondering, do I have to go into sales in order to be successful in business? What do you think about that? No, absolutely not. I mean, I've, I've worked with people who have come in um, from all different types of roles. So sales, finance, service. Um, I think the, the most important thing is to to do an excellent job. That's table stakes. You have to deliver. You have to do a job well, um, but also always looking for that that opportunity to, to add additional value where you are. And that's the thing that I always did in my career. And I didn't realize um, that that was getting me noticed or what it really was doing it. I, I always just wanted to share what I was learning and share with my teams. Um, and so I was always bringing in articles and um, learning new things and then sharing them in meetings or doing a presentation on something that I had gotten exposed to. And that's actually what started to get me noticed um, to be able to show that I had different interests and could do different things. And so um, finally, I, I realized that um, doing that was actually helping me as much as I didn't realize, you know, it's helping other people and that's what I wanted to do, but it also did help me advance in my career. The other thing um, is I didn't have my MBA when I was in sales and I didn't have it when I was in marketing either. And I had this limiting factor in my head that you had to have your MBA to go into marketing. And um, what I found was I didn't have to have that. I eventually did get it because it was something that I wanted to do for me. But um, what I learned from that was that you could you should you can't put limiting um, factors on your career from what you see around you. You have to understand that um, you have your own potential. You are unique in your own way. You have your own strengths, and you should you know double down and capitalize on those all you can to be able to do different things with your career. So never limit your yourself by what you think is the case. Um, and that's what I learned when I 
got into marketing without my MBA because I brought something different to the table that other people that did have their MBAs at the time um, in that department didn't have. Like I had sales experience. I knew how to sell a product and how to position it from selling. They knew it from business school or they knew it from being in marketing, but I brought something different to the table. And that's um, that was a really big lesson for me to make sure that I wasn't limiting myself with the beliefs and the things that I thought were true that weren't. Um, and so as I continue on in my career, I made sure that if I had those limiting thoughts, I really stopped to question them and make sure that that wasn't holding me back to get to the next step. Fabulous advice. And for those who didn't get all that written down, not to worry, we become a podcast from the show. And we're also going to take excerpts from the show and continue to post them for the next six, eight months. So you won't miss a word of what Kathy just said. That is like a, a mini MBA in five seconds, so, which is fantastic. I think we have a question. Our uh, producer is telling me that there's a question coming up. And there is Marnie from San Francisco. Oh, Nicole, this is a great question. Truck drivers are pretty much essential to your business. Do you think that's a calling or do you think um, it's in demand? And what about women who become truck drivers? Yeah, so there definitely is a driver shortage in America, and that is contributing to the supply chain disruption issues. Normally, when we have various times when we have uh, driver shortages, there's a pipeline of drivers that are coming in. And what happened during COVID that makes this time so unique and different is that all of the driving schools shut down. So we have less of a pipeline now in addition to the normal factors of drivers aging out of the system and what have you. Regarding women, our industry is pretty unique in that most of our drivers are home every single night. So they go out, they pick up the truck, they make deliveries to local restaurants, schools, hotels, and they are home every single night. We do have some shuttle drivers, but so for us, um, recruiting for women in, in this position is absolutely essential and a, and a a candidate pool that has been untapped up to this point, mostly because I think there's not as many women who get their CDL licenses. They think of it as more of a man's job. Once they realize, though, that they can um, use their other skills, it's not just the driving skills in our profession, but it's also customer service skills, interacting with customers. It is a physical job. There's no question they're unloading products and things like that, but it's a great job for males and females alike simply because they're home every single night with their family and they don't necessarily have that opportunity if they're doing over the road driving. So it's a great opportunity to be in the food service industry if you're a CDL licensed driver. Wow, well, hopefully some female drivers who are interested to work for Nicholas and Company will give you a call. I think your website went up on the screen so uh, they can certainly contact you. That would be fantastic. Uh, so Nicole, just a few more comments on culture. I believe that you did some very interesting things to maintain the culture of your employees, but also within the community during COVID. Do you want to share some of that with us? Sure. So at the beginning of the pandemic, like many other distributors in our situation, we had product that was in the warehouse, product that was on order coming in that we couldn't stop those POs. And so we had an excess of inventory. So early on in the pandemic, we started a program called Helping Heroes, we partnered with our uh, customers to be able to get products loaded out into the communities in which we serve. So it was excess product. We also were helping donate that product to the restaurants so that they could keep their workers working and providing meals to local um, uh, firefighters and police officers and first you know, rescuers. And so that was an important thing that we did. We created a task force and so many of our team members came together to help, which was in alignment with our culture. So very proud of that. Amazing. You should be proud of that. That's incredible. I think we have a couple of questions. We'll probably time only for one more. So let's see uh, who is asking us questions. This is Donna from Chicago. Kathy, this is for you. Oh, she was wondering what I have wondered. How do you commute to a different city for work from where you live? And do you think a lot of companies are okay with that? In other words, you can literally live anywhere and work anywhere. What do you think, Kathy? So I think with the pandemic, a lot of companies are definitely finding themselves forced to answer that question. Um, and I think more of them definitely are more open to people who don't necessarily live right where their company is located. But I really think that also depends on the company itself and the culture and where your team is located too. So for myself, 
my team is predominantly located in, in Kansas City. So for me to be in Atlanta when my team is predominantly here wouldn't make me feel super comfortable. So that's why you know I want to be here and, and Abbott, um, Abbott tends to be more about collaboration in the office as well, but with flexible options. So I think there's a good balance there. A lot of companies I, I've spoken to with friends and other companies um, have also said, you know, everybody's wrestling with this issue about how remote is okay, how much in the office is going to keep people there. So it, it's definitely a big question, but I think that companies are warming up more and more to the fact that people want to have some more flexibility. And so I think it's more about flexibility than it is about exactly where you live. Um, yeah. yeah. Makes, makes sense to me. Uh, I know we have one more question. I don't want to leave this uh, viewer out. So if we can just put his up quickly and let's see if we can get a quick answer. It's Theo from Palm Beach. And Nicole, is our food supply this winter going to be affected by the supply chain issues that you mentioned? What about local suppliers? Can they help with it? What do you think? Yes, our, our industry experts and leaders believe that the supply chain disruption issues are going to continue. And we are trying to source from local suppliers. As I mentioned, we're, we're you know, trying to find various suppliers so that we have substitute items and more items you know, to help make sure that we have product in stock for our customers. The problem that we usually have with smaller producers is that uh, they don't have enough um, capacity to be able to get us the product that we need for an organization and an operation that's our size. Um, but we're definitely trying to do as much of our local um, sourcing as possible, not only because it's just better for um, the industry, but it's better for the environment. It's better because the product is there. We tend to have better, stronger relationships, um, you know, knowing that the product is, is right there and it doesn't have to be trekked in from overseas or from across the country to get to us. Yeah, we just have a few minutes left, but there is a generic question I want to ask both of you. So give me your thoughts. And this is personal opinion, really not to do with any anybody's company. Uh, there's been a lot written about how women have been affected more than men during uh, the COVID pandemic and also in terms of return to work. Uh, Kathy, some of your thoughts on that? Well, I definitely think it's true. Um, you know, history shows as well as all the studies show that women are still um, predominantly the caregivers in their homes. So, you know, I, I do think that, you know, because of that and, and with children still being in and out of school, even if you're back in school, your children get sent home because of COVID outbreaks or exposure or what have you, um, you know, as employers, it really is incumbent upon us to be more sensitive and open to um, the flexibility. Again, it goes back to, to me, it's about flexibility. It's flexibility to help um, our workforce accommodate whatever it is that they're dealing with in their lives. And while it's definitely impacted women more, um, we certainly have men that are impacted with that as well. And so um, now more than ever, especially with a labor shortage, we have to be really in tune with what's going on in our employees' personal lives and be in touch with that. And that more than anything um, matters because people wanna know that they're cared for. They wanna know that they're valued as humans first and foremost, um, and they're not just an asset working for us. So for me, um, to help with, with the problem with women leaving the workforce and the impact of COVID on women, it's, it's about that level of engagement and care for the employee and the person first um, above all else. And so, Nicole, this is a huge issue in the food business in general, in the restaurant. And from the statistics I've been reading, it says that vast percentages of women and men, too, who've been working in the food industry are not going to go back into it. What's your experience in this? Definitely. All of our customers are telling us that they're having labor shortage issues. We see it on a daily basis. Again, as a consumer, you see it when you go to a restaurant and you see that they're short staffed or you might see that they're, they have different hours of operation than they used to. Even though the restrictions have been list, lifted with distancing, they're not able to operate, you know, um, breakfast, lunch and dinner anymore seven days a week that they used to because they have staffing shortages. So definitely an issue in our industry. And I think um, there are a lot of creative, innovative people who are trying to figure out what more we can do as an industry to attract and retain excellent employees. Well, that's exactly the nicest note that we could end on because it's positive, optimistic and upbeat. Nicole, Kathy, thank you so much. You've educated us a lot today and we loved having you on the show. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, unfortunately, we came to the end of today's show, but that doesn't mean there are no more shows. We have a whole year of shows, a calendar that is booked out solid for you, and I hope you will join us on those shows. Please look for the promotion and the date, the time on LinkedIn, and of course, on all other social media. We're on Amazon Music, we're on Spotify, we have podcasts of the show, and we continue to post on all the social media. So please join us there and ask your questions. I do have a question for you today. And that is, do you buy your food supplies locally? And if you specifically want a product, do you care whether it's local or not? My email is coming up on the screen. So I'd love to hear your answer for that. And of course, please do post your questions. We'd love to answer them. It was such a pleasure having you with us today. What fabulous guests, weren't they terrific? See you in the next show. Bye everybody. Mm -hmm.